Hi, my name is Nicole Grabo. I'm at ATOM 2018. I'm an objects conservator at the Midwest Art Conservation Center, and I'm here today talking about conservation planning techniques for feathers. Um, and there are a few things that I'd like to start off discussing before we get into my cleaning demonstration. In the field of conservation, we strive to make all of our, or as many of our methodologies as possible, reversible. Um, and the reason for that is that in case a new method comes along, we want to be able to undo our work and do it again in a better way. However, there are still examples of techniques that we use that are not reversible. And when we use those techniques, we have to be very sure that the, um, that the action is justified. And the most common example of that is cleaning. Um, cleaning is not a reversible technique. I can't put the dirt back on if I decide that it was a bad idea to do it. So although cleaning is something that seems like um, it's obvious when it needs to happen, when we approach it from a conservation perspective and when we're working with objects of cultural heritage, it's actually a very serious decision to undertake. One that I don't undertake lightly and one that it's important to be justified. And to know both why I'm cleaning, what it is that I'm removing, and how I will know when I've gone too far, when to stop. Because artifacts can easily be overcleaned. Overcleaning can remove important material that contains part of the information necessary to know their story. And it also can be damaging to the material itself. So um, I encourage everyone who is interested in cleaning their artifacts to approach it very seriously um, and, to, and, to, and to think of it very carefully and to proceed slowly and with caution. Always testing areas before you go on and always beginning with the least interventive technique before proceeding to something more aggressive. Um, with that said, I'll tell you just a little bit about um, about the feather um, and encourage you to look at feathers um, closely and carefully before you start cleaning. I have some examples of feathers here. These are, these are new feathers. These are not feathers that were associated with an artifact. And they're, they're game birds. These are probably from ducks. Um, there, um, there are important restrictions and guidelines governing the possession of feathers. Um, and it's important to familiarize yourself with those if you have not already. Um, but these were legally obtained and not, um, not associated with an artifact and are relatively fresh and new. Um, the feather has several different anatomical components. Um, the body of the feather here is called the vein. The center part here is the rachis, sometimes pronounced rashi. Um, the section here, which is embedded in the skin of the bird during its life, is called the calamus. And this is hollow. Sometimes on feathers that have been used for artifacts, you may see, such as on this example, that the calamus has been partially cut away. And this will sometimes be folded back on itself and tucked into the hollow shaft in order to create a loop so that the feather can be strung onto a larger object. The feather is made of keratin, which is a proteinaceous material. And what that means is that it's going to be, um, it's going to degrade in ways that are similar to other proteinaceous materials. And the things that we generally look for are um, brittleness, darkening as the feathers age. Um, the keratin is what's known as a thermoplastic material, which just means that as the temperature increases, as it gets warmer, it becomes softer. Um, and the converse is also true. If feathers are very cold, they're going to be more brittle. And that's something that you should think of when you're handling them and considering cleaning, um, particularly if a, if a feather or feathered artifact has been frozen, perhaps for an insect treatment. Um, it's very important that when you're handling the artifact that it have a chance to come up to room temperature first, because it'll be much more brittle when it's cold, and brittleness increases the risk of damage. Um, as feathers age, they become more brittle. So my cleaning example here is going to be with a new feather, and I encourage anyone who is going to be cleaning feathers to practice on new feathers first, but also to keep in mind that those feathers are going to be more resilient. They're going to be softer than, than any historical, historical item. Another thing that is um, interesting to note about the anatomy of a feather is that the vein is made up of tiny branches that come out from the rachis, and those are called barbs. What's harder to see from the naked eye is that the barbs are connected to one another by smaller barbs, smaller branches called barbules, and then those are connected to each other by even smaller barbs called hooklets. 
which means that the feather sticks itself together almost like Velcro. And one of the things, one of the jobs of the bird during its lifetime is to realign any barbs, barbules, and hooklets that have become misaligned with its beak. And it, this is the preening that it does and it helps the feather to keep its shape. So one of the things that we do when we're cleaning feathers is we realign all of those little hooklets and we zip the feather back up again. Um, but that is, that is something that's good to do on a clean feather. If you've got a dirty feather, the dirt's gonna get in the way. It's not going to zip it back up again. But just as an example, um, a feather that has become unhooked will look like so. And this is a very common appearance of historical feathers. So in the act of cleaning, keep in mind that your final step is going to be to realign the hooks and the barbs and the barbules so that the vein has its whole shape once again. And it does take some time. There are several different kinds of dirt. Um, it's important before you can begin cleaning to know what your dirt is and if the dirt is significant, if it's part of the story that the artifact has to tell. Because if that's the case, then I would recommend not removing it. Um, sometimes feathered objects have been danced and they may have campfire smoke and that may be something that you would like to preserve as part of the history of the piece. Um, if the dirt on the object is simply museum dust, um, it might be more of an obvious candidate for removal. You can distinguish between the two by, um, sometimes by color. Campfire smoke has a tendency to be more yellow or brown, whereas museum dust tends to be gray or whitish. Um, these two feathers here have been artificially dirtied by me. They contain neither campfire smoke nor museum dust, but they provide a nice exercise for cleaning demonstrations. Um, and so when you are faced with a feathered object that you feel like might need cleaning, the first thing is to kind of consider what it is that you're removing and how you will know when you have removed it. Um, so assuming that, that these feathers are good candidates for cleaning, um, we've determined that they're in stable enough condition to handle the physical action of cleaning because a feather that's very damaged or degraded will not be able to tolerate any cleaning at all and will simply fall apart. But in this case, these ones are pretty strong. And what you want to look for is to see if, there, um, if there's any powdering or loss, missing sections of the veins. If you find any loose bits of feather nearby that appear to have broken off recently, then that's gonna be an indication that your feather is too fragile to clean. If your feather seems fine, but then when you start to clean it, um, you find that material is coming off, again, that feather is too brittle to be able to endure cleaning. But as I mentioned, these ones are new, so they're gonna be pretty good examples for the cleaning demonstration that I'm gonna give you. Now the materials that you need, you'll see that I've got some white pieces of paper here. This is cotton blotter paper, um, which I like to use underneath my feathers when I'm working. With loose feathers, it's a lot easier, but I use these when I'm working on feathered objects also. I'll simply cut a smaller piece and I'll hold it behind the feather. Or I'll position it behind the feather to provide a support um, as I'm taking off the dirt. It's not always possible to do that. Some objects are so densely packed with feathers that you can't get in between them. But when you can, it's nice to have something like a cotton blotter paper behind it. I also have brushes here of a variety of different um, thicknesses and sizes and bristle stiffness. Um, I tend to use relatively inexpensive brushes when I'm doing cleaning because cleaning is messy work and um, the brushes, you know, oftentimes can't can't be easily reused um, or cleaned. So, you know, I like it if they're disposable. Keep in mind also that, especially when you're using inexpensive brushes, um, you can change the shape of them with scissors. The stiffness of a brush is related more to the length of the bristles than it is to the material the bristles are made out of. So if you find like with a brush like this that it's a little too floppy and maybe you want a little bit more stiffness, I might go and just kind of trim the end off of it a little bit to make it stiffer can also change the shape of your brushes with scissors if you like. Um, and all of that is kind of easier to do if your brush is not as expensive as it might be. Um, I generally start with a softer brush, um, and then if I find that the feather can withstand it, I might go to something that's a little bit more stiffer. So it's good to have a variety. 
I put blue tape on the ends of my brushes in order to cover the metal ferrule. That metal ferrule is a little sharp and can scratch, so think of the tape as just a little bit of a cushion. Um, and I use my brushes for a lot of different purposes, so that's just kind of a nice extra layer of protection. I also like to have a pointy wooden stick. This is a bamboo skewer purchased at the grocery store for barbecuing. Um, these pointy sticks are great for um, doing vein realignment for sometimes um, on the, uh, the rachis, there might be areas of dirt that you can kind of scrape off a little bit. Um, the pointy stick is an indispensable tool, so I recommend that. These are cosmetic sponges. Um, these sponges are available on the internet. Um, they're for makeup removal. Um, if you're interested in purchasing them, I do recommend that you be sure that what you purchase does not have any makeup or any moisturizer in it. These need to be empty and clean. This is not an archival material and these do not last um, a very long time. Once the package has been opened, they start to get yellow. So when you see them start to yellow, which is usually after a day or two, throw them away. They're, they're, um, they're beginning to break down and you don't want them to leave little bits of, um, of material behind. So you know, use them fresh, throw them away. They're inexpensive. This is um, a soot sponge, which is um, more, uh, more high quality conservation material. Um, and this also has the ability to kind of pick up a dirt. It's a little bit, um, it's a little bit bulkier, a little bit clumsier than the cosmetic sponges, but it can also be a good tool to have. And these can also be cut and shaped with scissors. So you're not restricted to the size that's here. Um, if you are someone who is sensitive to dust, I do recommend wearing a dust mask when you're doing cleaning, particularly for artifacts that have a lot of dust. This is for your personal protection. Um, these, masks, these masks are also readily available um, and, uh, and very stylish, um, but I definitely recommend that. If you find that you're working with dusty collections materials and you're feeling overly tired or headachey, try, try wearing a dust mask and it will probably help. Um, another tool that is indispensable is um, a vacuum with a HEPA filter. That's a high efficiency particulate air filter. Um, I don't have our vacuum with us here today, but what I do have are the kind of micro attachments for the vacuum. So the vacuum hose itself has, um, has an opening that's about yay big, and you can buy these um, micro attachment kits, and this gives you an adapter. So this goes on the opening, and then you can attach this hose here onto this opening, and then it comes with you know a bunch of little attachments. I like to use just the straight one, and what I'll do is I will put some cheesecloth over the top like this, and then I'll tape it or you know attach it with a rubber band. And what this does is this ensures that you're not going to vacuum up any little bits of feather, um, and it just it provides a little bit of a of a little bit of a buffer. Um, it's important to use a vacuum with a variable speed and to use the lowest speed possible. You don't want too much suction um, because you don't want to run the risk of causing damage to your feathers. So I also will sometimes use a little bit of deionized water. I have a little bit of water here. Although I will caution you that wet cleaning, um, wet cleaning techniques are much riskier than dry cleaning techniques and you're much more likely to cause damage to your feather by using wet cleaning techniques. So I only use them on very strong, very resilient feathers where I have already exhausted the dry cleaning techniques and found that there's still some dirt that um, is disfiguring enough that I would like to take an additional step to attempt to reduce it. Um, I'm going to show you a little bit of wet cleaning, but I would um, urge you to stay with dry cleaning techniques as much as possible. Um, the, the feathers themselves, when they're exposed to moisture, they absorb that moisture and become softer. And the risk of damage to the hooklets is much, much greater. And as soon as those hooklets are broken and damaged, the feather can no longer be zipped back up to form a solid vein, and it will always look ragged and ratty like this. So that's definitely something that we want to avoid. And if you find throughout your cleaning that your end results are feathers that do not zip back up properly to form the, the vein, then that's an indication that your cleaning method is too aggressive for the feathers that you're using. And you need to step back and use a softer brush, be gentle. Um, and sometimes you may end up leaving dirt behind 
And that is okay, because these are historic objects and they've had a long life and their life is on their surface and we need to respect their, um, their physical integrity first. So with that said, we have our materials. A note about safety and pesticides. Oftentimes, um, feathered objects have been treated with pesticides in order to prevent insect infestation. Those pesticides are toxic to humans and will um, stay on the surface. They're not removed during cleaning, unfortunately. Um, if, you, if you have a history of pesticide use in your institution, it's important to know that. If you have any questions about whether your materials have been treated with pesticides, I would um, call us, do some pesticide testing, find out more information before you do any cleaning. Um, it is, uh, in cleaning objects like this, if they have been treated with poisons, you're putting yourself at great risk. So um, if there's any doubt or any question in your mind, I would refrain from cleaning. Um, even so, using gloves is a good idea. Um, to protect yourself and to protect the feathers from your finger oils. Although, I will also add that feathers are one type of object um, that are in some ways benefited by the oils from our fingers. It mimics the oils that the, that the bird itself would have applied during preening and sometimes can be beneficial to the realignment of the vein. So when we get to that stage, we'll actually take our gloves off. But um, at the beginning of the cleaning stage, it's good to have gloves. So we've examined our feather. We're not worried about pesticides. We're sure that we want to remove the dirt. And we think that it's going to be stable enough to handle the rigors of cleaning. We've assembled our materials. And I'm gonna focus on this feather. So imagine that I have a vacuum here, and with one hand, I'm holding the vacuum nozzle close to the feather. And with my other hand, I am lightly brushing the dirt off so that the vacuum can suck it up. Move from the center of the feather out to the edge, Begin very lightly and work your way across the feather. You don't have to start at the top or the bottom. You can start wherever you like. Sometimes you may be able to tape your vacuum nozzle to the side of your table or to a location and then bring the feather close to it so that you can use both hands more easily. And you work slowly and carefully up and down the feather, removing as much of the dirt as possible. Keeping the blotter paper behind you for support. Cleaning both sides of the feather, if you have access, if the artifact, um, if the feathered object is, is part of a larger artifact with composite materials and the feathers are sewn in place or strung in place, it may not be possible to clean the back, and that's fine. If it's very, very difficult for you to get to the back, it was also probably very difficult for the dust to get to the back, and the back is likely not as dirty as the front. So simply do what you can. Don't put the feather in any danger in order to clean it. Simply clean what you can reach as you can reach it. Now the dirt that's on this particular feather is sort of caked on in a way that museum dust generally isn't, which gives us an added challenge. But you can see that with a new feather such as this, it's actually fairly resilient. And I'm able to get a lot of this dirt off without removing any of the feather barbs themselves. If you have dirt like this that is caked, you can use the pointed stick to gently break apart little sections of the feather that might be stuck together. Again, being very careful not to damage the feather. And if you see 
bits that come off that are not dirt, but that look like feather itself, then that's an indication that you've gone too far and you need to stop and you need to let the dirt be there and step back. Feather cleaning is an exercise in patience and managing your expectations. Um, often feathers that are in poor condition when you start with, well, they might be much better when you finish, are still not going to look like new feathers. Um, so manage your own expectations, manage the expectations of your curators. It's very important to remove as much dust and dirt as you can. It's better for the health of the feather, but physically um, and visually, the result is often um, perhaps not perfect. You can see I'm sort of moving to clean areas on the blotter paper. The blotter paper helps to receive the dirt. And when you're cleaning in a situation like this where you have loose feathers, sometimes it's not as necessary to have your vacuum right next to you. But the vacuum can be really helpful if you're cleaning like a feathered headdress or something that's very large. Um, but you can perhaps already see even just five minutes of cleaning and a lot of the large dirt has come away. Now say, um, say I've been working on this for some time and there's some areas that are still very tenacious and I would like to go a little bit farther with my cleaning. After the brush, using the cosmetic sponge, we can go across the vein, again from the inside, from the center, the rachis, to the out. And you can see that some dirt has come off onto the cosmetic sponge. This is really good at kind of picking up and grabbing that dirt. So this can be another technique that you can use in addition to your brush. And then you can see, you know, you can work similarly with something like the soot sponge. You know, sometimes, depending on what your dirt is, just a little bit different texture might respond a little bit better. And if you're doing loose feathers, again, you know, make sure you get the inside. If you can get to the inside on your feathered object, do that as well. And then when I use moisture, I'll show you, there are a couple of different ways that I do it. I do not dip my brush in water. That's too much water. Um, I might begin by actually using um, a, a small spray bottle and just dampening the blotter slightly and letting the feather rest on the blotter and then continuing with the cosmetic sponge and sometimes just a very, very slightly damp blotter can absorb a little bit of that dust and dirt better. And sometimes what I will do is I'll take my cosmetic sponge, I'll just dip it into the water, I will squeeze it out so it's only very slightly damp. And I'll start from the strongest area of the feather and I'll make sure that it's okay. And I won't dwell on the surface. I won't go back over an area more than twice. I'll simply Go up the feather like so and see what additional dirt can come off. If you ever get to a point where your feather starts to darken, it's too moist. We really just want to use the barest amount of moisture when we're wet cleaning. And as I said, wet cleaning is much riskier than dry cleaning. I would exhaust all dry cleaning methods first. Um, and if what you're working with is purely museum dust and it's quite loosely bound, there should be no need to do any wet cleaning at all. Once the feather is clean, and I would continue farther with this one, um, if this were an object that I were cleaning and this is not clean yet, but for the purposes of the demonstration, when we're realigning the barbs and zipping the feather back up, um, I believe it is acceptable to use your bare hands. And in some ways, I think that this is a task that is best suited to bare fingers. Make sure that your hands are clean and dry, that you're not wearing any moisturizer on your hands, and that there's nothing on your feather that you're worried about touching. Um, and if that is all the case, then you can handle your feather with one hand by um, the calamus. And then using your thumb and your index finger, you can begin to work up the feather. Sometimes it takes a while and sometimes it's necessary to kind of undo an area and redo it. 
And sometimes it's necessary to take your pointy stick and to separate areas that have become misaligned so that you can realign them. Sometimes feathers will have, I don't have a good example here, but sometimes, um, sometimes a feather that is in otherwise good condition will have a little bit of a wave to it. And what that means, what that is an indication of is that the, the barbs, which are kind of supposed to be aligned like this, have kind of shifted a little bit. Um, and, and sometimes the feather preening and the rezipping can really help to restore the, um, the cohesive shape to the edge of the bang. So take your time with this step. And, um, and as long as your feather is clean and in good condition, I think you will be pleasantly surprised with how much of an improvement simple, um, simple feather preening can make. So that is my demonstration for, um, for cleaning feathers. I hope it's been helpful to you. Um, if you have any questions about feathers, conservation, cleaning, please feel free to contact me or anyone from my organization or the Midwest Art Conservation Center based in Minneapolis. Thank you.